Everyone, please bow with us. Our Lord and, and Master and Father in heaven, we bow our unworthy and unfit head unto thy glory at this time. We thank you, God, for this precious privilege you've given us to, uh, to gather together with the saints of the Lord here in thy house to, to worship thee. God, we thank you for this, this place that you've given us to, to gather together. And we thank you, Lord, for your rich providence and temporal grace that we could gather together without being molested by the wickedness of this this world that exists at this present time. God, we thank You, Lord, for the pastor here at uh, at Faith Primitive Baptist Church. We appreciate his his diligence and and his never-tiring effort to to serve Thy children. Uh, We pray, God, You would bless Brother Charles in uh, in his time of need. We pray, God, Your grace would be with him and and Sister Linda and, uh, and their home. God, I pray you'd bless uh, all the membership of the church, that we would all be convicted, Lord, uh, concerning thy kingdom and, uh, and thy service here in this world. God, we pray that you'd bless all these that are on the hearts and minds of thy children. God, we know that thou knowest all things, and there's nothing that could be brought to thy attention that you haven't already known. But we come to thee in prayer, Lord, this time, believing that your ears are open under our cries. And we believe that Thou art able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So we come to Thee at this time and beg, God, that Thy grace would be with them. And we pray, God, that we would ask according to Thy will that You would strengthen them in their time of need. God, we pray that You would bless this service. We pray, God, You would bless our our brothers in Christ, uh, Brother Kerry and Brother Dan. As they stand before Thy people, we pray, God, that You would loosen their lips. And we pray, God, You would loosen their tongue and free their mind from the cares of this world, and we pray, God, the help of thy spirit would be with them as they preach the gospel. And I pray, God, you'd open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we could receive and be good ground, that we could bring forth fruit of thy glory. God, as we go forward in this service, we beg for thy help and thy presence in our time of need. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. 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 I, am, uh, I am very thankful. this privilege and opportunity to be back here at uh, at Faith Primitive Baptist Church. Uh, my son Joshua got up early this morning to, to make this, this drive with us. We started at, uh, at about 6 a.m. this morning and, uh, and I talked to Joshua about the length of time that has passed since the last time I was I was here. And I'm I'm going to guess because if you can't tell I'm a little older than I was the last time I was here. I'm thinking it was somewhere between ten and twelve years ago it was the last time I think I was here at Faith Primitive Baptist Church. You know, time goes by so so quickly. I've been the pastor at uh, at Union Grove Primitive Baptist Church for for seven years there in, in North Carolina. And I'd like to go ahead and tell you the drive to there is the same as the drive I had to come to here. And I would like to encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to come and see us and visit us at Union Grove Primitive Baptist Church. Um, the church there believes the same thing you believe here at, at Faith Primitive Baptist Church. Um, the pastor here at uh, Faith Primitive Baptist Church, Brother Charles, is uh, very special to me. Um, I mentioned to Brother Dan, um, Brother Charles knew me before I even had the ability to know anybody, Sister Linda. <laughs> because Brother Charles and Sister Linda knew me when I was just a little baby. I'm going to guess probably Sister Linda held me in her arms when I was a baby. Is that a pretty good guess, Sister Linda? So I've known them all my life. And Brother Charles' son, Brother Joey, I think I'm from May the 16th to June 28th. Is that right, his birthday? That's how much older I am than Brother Joy. And we we grew up together. And I can remember um, in my experience as a child of God hearing the news that Brother Charles had joined the Primitive Baptist. And, you know, Brother Charles, that had an effect on me, that example. And after it was my brother Bobby and my my daddy and... uh, and I was thankful 
that God gave me an opportunity to be part of the Lord's church. Um, I didn't come all this way to, to talk about me. I, I didn't come all this way to talk about you. I hope we've gathered together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, and I hope that me sharing some experience with you this morning hasn't worn out your ears before we look into the Lord's Word. Please turn with me to Psalm 53. Sometimes you hear individuals say Psalms chapter 53, some Psalm 53. Brother Dan, it's, it's okay with me as long as we're all on the same page. Psalm 53, there's just one verse I want us to pay attention to in Psalms 53. It's verse 5. And David is the penman here, but it's important to remember that God is the author. That's what it means when we say all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's different individuals that are penmen, but God is the author. In verse 5, David is the penman, God the author, and David writing by inspiration of Spirit, says, There were they in great fear, where no fear was. For God hath scattered the bones of him that encampeth against thee. Thou hast put them to shame, because God hath despised them. In my time of studying God's holy word, I've, I've heard two different interpretations of, of that verse. Now I'll go ahead and confess to you that I lean heavily toward the, the latter. The first is this verse is making reference to the ungodly and the wicked who have no fear of God. And because they've come to a time that they'd face God, that now they would manifest fear where there at one time no fear was because it's God that would scatter their bones. And I'll confess to you I struggle with that interpretation. And the reason I struggle with that interpretation is that word thee that's in the midst of that verse. The word thee literally means to you in specific. Well, that word thee, meaning you in specific, as David writes to the children of God, I think the proper interpretation is making reference to the wicked that would surround the righteous or the godly that's in this world. And because of that, they had great fear where no fear was or there was no reason for them to fear. Why? Because it's God, for God, because God hath scattered the bones of him that encampassed against thee. So what David is saying to the children of God that are in fear, they have great fear where really there's no reason for them to fear. You know, the Bible teaches us much about the subject of fear. Fear is, is the motion that we all have. God made us soul, body, and spirit, and within that spirit and soul there, there are emotions. And in those emotions there can be healthy and unhealthy emotions. So it is with fear. There is unhealthy fear and there's healthy fear. Like when I was growing up, my mom and dad taught me not to play close to a railroad track. Well, that's healthy fear. There's nothing wrong with a mom and dad teaching their children not to play too close to a railroad track because you may be ran over by a train. There's nothing wrong with parents telling their children not to get too close to the water because they, they may drown before they learn to swim. That's healthy fear. There's nothing wrong with teaching children to drive and you know chewing off all your fingernails while they're trying to drive, wearing and grabbing the wheel. And I've been there. My son is 18 now. And I'm happy to say now, Brother Lane, that he can drive better than me at this time. But I've been there and it's healthy fear. There's also unhealthy fear. Unhealthy fear is when we're worried and filled with worry and care and fear over something that will never come to fruition. I heard someone say that I know worrying works because everything I worry about never comes to pass. <laughs> That's unhealthy fear. You know, David in Psalm 27 gives us a lot of remedy for fearing in this life. And he begins that by saying, The Lord is my salvation and my strength. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the light of my life. Of whom shall I, I be afraid? You know, the Lord came to Abraham there in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1 and told him that he is his shield and exceeding great reward. But the first thing he said is, fear not, fear not. 
You know, God also said that to Isaac there in Genesis 26, verse 24. He also told Jacob not to fear. But David here makes reference to those that were in great fear when there was no reason, reason to fear. These individuals had unhealthy fear and there was no reason for them to have that unhealthy fear. Have you ever noticed Psalms 53 is very similar to Psalms 14? If you go to Psalm 14, it's very similar to Psalm 53. If you look at this, both those psalms side by side, those psalms side by side, you'll notice that David was a much younger man when he penned Psalm 14 than he is here when he penned Psalm 53. And you know the lesson there is David saw that there were wicked and ungodly sinners when he was a young man, and when he became an old man, there were still ungodly and wicked sinners here on the earth. You know, and I don't care how young you are on the pew and you see the wickedness on earth, when you get older, there's still going to be wickedness on, on the earth. And I'm only 55 now, but I can tell you my life and experience is there was wickedness when I was a young man and there's wickedness now that I'm an old man. You remember David said there in Psalms 37, verse 24, he said, I have been, old, I have been young, but now I'm old and I haven't seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. It's important that we keep that verse in context. Have you ever met someone that had radical interpretations of Scripture? You know, when they take a verse like that and go to the extreme end of it, well, if you do, you're going to think about people that have been in poverty on the earth, and you're going to have to say, well, apparently they're not God's children. What David is saying is, in my experience, this is what I have seen. And what a blessed experience he had, Brother Dan, that he could say, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now, in my lifetime, I have saw people that I believe were children of God on earth begging for bread. But I can say this with David, that God is able to overcome all the troubles that we face in, in this life. David said, I'm young, I've, I've been young, and now I'm old. He's been young, he saw sin on the earth, now he's old. He sees sin on the earth. But in that experience that David has, and David faced much opposition concerning that sin, he said there have been times that there was great fear when no fear was. For just a few moments, I want us to think about four different contexts where children of God, the children of grace, that were chosen in covenant before the foundation of the world, redeemed at the cross of Calvary, and the Holy Spirit is in them by the direct work of the Holy Spirit in regeneration, where those children have had great fear where no fear was. The first is in the condemnation of sin. Right. When I look back in my life and my experience, I remember a time when I was nine years old, and Brother Charles and Sister Linda know exactly where this is, at Union Hill Missionary Baptist Church. There was a man named John Meeks was in the pulpit preaching. And I had been overly condemned in my conscience and in my heart about sin. You know, when people preached, you're a sinner, I, I knew it. I was condemned. And I remember being nine years old. I was sitting on this side of the church house there at Union Hill. And Sister Martha Ferguson was on the same pew, Brother Charles. I came out and walked to a mourner's bench. And I remember John Meeks telling me, pray your heart out. Right. I made that journey from that pew to that mourner's bench because I was afraid of going to hell. There was a piece of property between my daddy's house and a creek that actually my uncle owned. And there was a road that went to the railroad tracks. And on that road off the side of it, I actually built my own altar. And I would go down there and pray a couple times a week asking God, save me. I didn't want to go to hell. I was overcome with the fear of hell. I was overcome. I remember... One night, and this was the night when I had all I could take of the Missionary Baptist, and I left the Missionary Baptist, and I joined the Primitive Baptist at Faith Primitive Baptist Church. We were there in Tacoma, Georgia. There was a night that a brother was in the pulpit preaching, and he came out of the pulpit. And I know Brother Charles and Sister Linda both remember Marty Reeves. You remember he lived right across from Turtle and Shirley Simmons. And he was friends with Joy and Shane and I. At the end of that service, Marty, the preacher, came out of the pulpit and he said, when you bow your head tonight, if there's anyone here that is afraid 
that you would go to hell if you died tonight. Please raise your hand. Well, I peeked and I, I know I want to see who, who raised their hand. The only person in that building that raised their hand that night was Marty Reams. And I thought to myself, that's the only honest person in this building. The only honest person in this building is Marty Reams. I felt as dishonest as a liar as I could be because I felt that I would go to hell any moment in my conscience and in my heart. I was afraid. God blessed me to hear finally in His goodness the truth of the gospel. The gospel truth. You know, there's only one truth. Right. You know, we need to come to that, that realization. There's only one truth. There's only one church. There's one truth. There's one faith, and that faith was once delivered to the saints, and that faith never needed to be reformed because it was never deformed. The faith once delivered to the saints, and God blessed me to hear that, and I was able to do some accounting and counting of my own experience, some self-inventory, and realizing that 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 I felt, that fear that I felt was only an evidence that I was already a born-again child of God. Right. Amen. David said in Psalm 73 and verse 5, The wicked are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued as other men. The wicked do not have the light of life turned on in them to see themselves a sinner. Paul would say in Romans 3.18 that they have no fear of God before their eyes. They are inwardly fools. And the only information they've ever received of God is an outside, outward information. If anyone ever tells you that everyone that's ever lived on this earth has an innate knowledge of God. They need to go read that Psalm 53 and Psalm 14 again because inwardly the fool is answering from the inside outward information that God exists. And he basically says, no God for me. That was not my experience. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus Christ. I love the people of God. All need to hear was the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that the reason I felt the way I felt was I was already a born again child of God. That's it. And when that happened there was some accounting that was done in my heart and I came to a place of peace Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 at peace in my experience that Jesus Christ had came into the world and died for a sinner like me. I love the gospel of grace. It gives me hope. Yes. The gospel of grace gives me hope. Without the gospel of grace, I have no hope. It's the only thing that gives a sinner like me hope. is that truth in the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has came into the world and by that death that He offered on the cross of Calvary, not in a garden, right. not praying on a rock, but on the cross of Calvary in His life that He gave that I have eternal justification before the Father. And what that means is in Jesus Christ, in Him before the Father, I'm just as if I never sinned. And brothers and sisters, if you feel the condemnation of sin in your experience, if you see yourself a sinner, if you see your shortcomings, if you love the church, if you love the Word of God, if you can say you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is about to be born of God. No, sir! That's not what it reads. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is, meaning already, born of God. I've got good news for you. As Elder Danny whispered, say, you're going to heaven. That's what that means. You're going to heaven because Jesus Christ did a great work for you on the cross of Calvary. He has separated you from the condemnation of your sins as far as the east is from the west. He has taken all your sins and sewed them up in a bag there in Job 14. He has cast your sins in the depths of the sea. Micah chapter 7 verse 9 and Isaiah chapter 38 verse 17. Your sins have been cast behind the back of God. A God whose eyes see all things. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Those eyes, they're able to see all things. There's one thing that God the Father cannot see, and it's your sin because it's been covered by the blood, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God!
Amen. For His eternal grace. And praise God for the Gospel yes. that helps a sinner like me to feel better in my heart that I can rejoice in what Jesus done for me. Amen. God bless you. Second context. It's when children of God face the opposition and troubles in this world. I don't know about you, but I've lived long enough. I've had a few troubles. How about you? Job said, man, this born of a woman is a few days, but he's full of troubles. You know, my daddy, he used to say this from the pulpit here. He said, I'm happy about that text because it's just a few days. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to a sister there at Union Grove, Primitive Baptist Church at their home a few weeks ago. And she said, boy, Brother Ronnie, I'm getting old. She's 91 years old. Her husband's 92. Faithful members of the church. I mean, you can't preach them off the pews. I told her, I said, you're not old. I said, Methuselah lived 969 years. I said, compared to that, you're young. She said, well, they didn't get as tired as we do back then. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have troubles. We have opposition. If you've lived in this world, you know that there are wicked people in this world. There are people that are they're selfish. They only live for themselves. I can tell you from experience... You know, jealousy is as cruel as the grave. The emotions of anger, the emotions of selfishness will push people to do some of the most ungodly, ungodly things. And sometimes you face those troubles in life, whether it be in the workplace, school, you, you, you come to a place of great fear. And you worry. But it's important to remember that God is greater than all of your opposition. And we could say there may have been great fear, but there's no reason for us to fear because God is with us. You know, David, when he penned that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. Read through that Psalm and you'll see how the Lord was with David in all of his troubles. All the opposition that Saul of Kish could have thrown his way. All the messengers that come to take his life. I can take you to 1 Samuel chapter 18, 19, and 20, and I can prove to you at least 15 different times Saul of Kish tried to take David, but he did not. Why? Because the Lord of glory was his help. And brothers and sisters, I will tell you, God is your help in life. David said in Psalms 46 and verse 1, the Lord is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. I like that word present. You know what that means? That means God's not too far away. That's right. You know, sometimes you're working around your house, you need some help and you call somebody and they may be a long way away. You call them up and you know, it even happens to a deacon sometimes. Sometimes you need some help and you call up and deacon say, I'm on vacation. I said, ain't that ungodly? Deacon, deacon's taking vacations. The preachers have to stay at home. <laughs> sometimes they're far away. And they can't help. I was just joking about that for the day. I love things that you grow. But God's not like friends and neighbors. Sometimes they're not at home when you need them. God's always right there when we need Him. And when we face those troubles, it's important for us to remember to walk close to God, believing that He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask to think. And when God is with us, there may be great fear, but there's no reason to be afraid. Because God is able. You know, I love the portion of Scripture that's found there in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 when the Apostle Paul makes reference to the Lord being His helper. He said, I will not fear what man should do unto me. Do you think the Apostle Paul was afraid when he stood before the Sanhedrin? Do you think he was afraid when he stood before the Roman rulers? Do you think he was afraid when he would stand before the gut? No, the Apostle Paul was not because he believed in the power and grace of God. It was the same power and grace of God that was with Hezekiah and the children of Israel when the Assyrians came to the gates of Jerusalem and made threatening remarks against them. I think it was Rabshiki that made the threatening remarks. His remarks is basically this, Your God is nothing and Hezekiah has lied to you about it. Rabshiki, when he said that, Hezekiah gathered everyone together and said almost the same thing that Elisha did in his servant there in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 16. Be not dismayed. You'll notice in verse 7, 2 Chronicles 32. Be not dismayed because of the king of Assyria and all the host that is with him. For there be more with us than they are with them. Right. Brothers and sisters, when God is with us, and the Bible said there in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30, they that honor me, I will honor. When God is with us, there be more with us than there are with them. So there may be great fear, but there's no reason to be afraid. Mm. Third context is facing manufactured fear. 
Brothers and sisters, we live in a time in the United States of America where people control the population through manufactured fear. Now, if somebody don't want to amen that, that's fine. I'll amen myself. It's the truth. Amen. <clears throat> the people of America are being controlled by manufactured fear. I recently listened to someone on a little, I guess it was a podcast, and the person was making reference to the three most important things to them when they go to the ballot box. And those three things were this. Family planning and reproductive liberty. Second was a fair tax code. And the third was someone that's concerned about environmental change, global warming, climate change. And I listened to that, and the individual said, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible when someone reduces reproductive rights and family planning to just a word called abortion. And I thought, no, what you're doing is you're belittling abortion to terminology like reproductive rights and family planning. That's what you're doing. Tax code, I don't think she understood what she said because the people that are paying her check were actually the billionaires she was talking about. And if you make them pay as much tax as everyone else in America combined is, they're going to be out of business and she's going to lose a job. And by the way, the woman really didn't want to do it herself because she knows if she had to do it herself, everyone like her would have to pay the taxes. And I guarantee you they're going to do all they can to pay as little tax as possible. The third, and this is the point I want to hit, this global warming environmental change. The world's getting hot. We're all going to get so hot, one day all the cornfields is going to burn up. And, and I'll be dog, it's going to be probably me that cranks up my Honda, Brother Dan. And I'll be the last one that cranks it up. As soon as I turn the key, all my grass is going to go to, to nothing. And we're going to be just all boiling. Our skin's going to be red. It's like we just went through radiation. That's what's going to happen. The world's getting warmer and warmer. You know, the only problem with that is, is I've read too much Bible to believe that. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of our environment that we live in. I'm not saying we, we should just throw trash all over the side of the road. But I'm saying we shouldn't be trapped and confined in fear where no fear, no fear is. Go read Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, what God said after the flood. I remember someone told me, they said, you know, and this was in Sunday school class, you know, when it comes to the end of time, you won't be able to tell when summer and winter. That's not what the Bible says. <laughs> The Bible says as long as the earth stands, there'd be seed time harvest, there'd be uh, summer and winter, all that as long as the earth standeth. As long as the earth stands. And I was recently uh, reading a man's comments about global warming and climate change. You notice they have to change their terminology in order to be more acceptable. And he stood before a large congregation of people and he said this, he said, listen, all the young people in the house, I want you to, to understand something about global warming and climate change. Don't worry about it. He said, I got some facts for you. In the summertime, it gets hot. <laughs> Another fact is sometimes their summers hotter than other summers. I mean, I can look at the young people in the church house today, they can confess that. There's some summers hotter than other summers. And by the way, the Lord in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 said He's reserved the destruction of the earth for Himself. If God has reserved that for Himself, I'm not concerned about man destroying the earth. If man was going to destroy the earth, he'd already done it. Right. But God has reserved something for Himself. He keeps that for Himself. And God one day will set the world on fire. But that will be by God. And God doing that when He destroys the earth with fire and brimstone. But i got good news for you on that one. The children of God will not be here when it happens. Because we'll be caught up in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Right. Final context. Fear or no fear is is death it's, itself. If you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, it makes reference to those who are in fear of death all their lifetime. Now, the born again child of God has the Lord in us, and we have something in us that's renewed every day. It doesn't get old, but in our flesh, our carnal nature, sometimes it dominates our mind. See, our mind can be dominated by either nature. And when it dominates our mind, we can have fear even, even of death. Have you ever talked to children of God that were afraid of just, just dying? I have. Someone says, I tell you what, I'm not afraid of dying, I'm ready to go now. And they'll go to the doctor and get pills and more pills to try to stay alive as long as they can. <laughs> 
Yeah, we, we, we get afraid. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm only 55. I know there's people older than me. I didn't say there's old people in the church. I said there's people older than me. I'm 55. I mean, I, my son's 18 now. I mean, it, death has it's gotten real for me. I mean, most, most of my life, if I live as long as I, I probably could live, most of my life are already behind me. So yeah, death gets real. Fear. The child of God may have great fear of death, but there's no reason to fear. There's great fear where no fear was. You know what the Bible calls death? The body going to sleep. Jesus spoke of His decease. You remember there in Luke chapter 9, verse 32, the death that He would accomplish in Jerusalem. That word death there is exodus, which literally means the exodus. The Apostle Paul made reference to that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, as a departure. I mean, I do a lot of flying to churches. I mean, I was in California a few weeks ago. I got on an airplane in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Brother Dan, I didn't get on the airplane just thinking I'd fly into oblivion. I got on an airplane. I was, I was expecting to land in Sacramento, California. And, you know, I got there, and I told someone I'm not from here. You know what they said? No kidding. <laughs> My southern accent gave it away. I'm not from California. And you know what? I said, thank God I'm not from here after I've been there for a while. Thank the Lord. I mean, you wouldn't believe this, but their well water out there, they have to pay taxes on their own well water. I mean, if you've got a well on your own property, you have to pay taxes in most counties in California for your own well water. I told them, I said, what y'all need is a bunch of Ben louder milks out here to stand up against this. <laughs> But anyway, when I departed from Charlotte, I didn't depart just thinking I'd go into oblivion. I departed expecting to be somewhere else. That's what death is. What happens in death, brethren and sisters, is the soul and spirit departs and is immediately in the presence of God. Right. Now, being in the presence of God is a place of rest. It's a place of joy. It's a place of happiness. You know what David said in Psalms 27 verse 13? He said, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, if I didn't believe that, that when I pass in this life, I'm going to be with the Lord, I would just give up a long time ago. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if in this life only I had hope in Christ, I'd be of all men most miserable. See, our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ is not only in this present time, but also in something beyond this. Right. And the Apostle Paul called it far better. And I'm going to end with this. I don't know how far, far it is, but I know it's a heap of a long way because the Apostle Paul said it was far better. May God richly yeah, bless you, I pray. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. First verse of Amazing Grace. Uh, amazing grace. This morning, and uh, I appreciate what's already gone before us. Love, brother, brother Ronnie. I, I always enjoy his preaching, and I, I always enjoy his preaching because I always get something out of it. And I'm, I'm thankful for the things that he has brought forward, um, and the and the clarity uh, in which he brings it. It's. Uh, I, I enjoy that, and it uh, it's easy food to feed on, and so we're thankful for that. Love love the church here. Again, as Brother Ronnie mentioned, we've got so many so many fond memories uh, being here at Faith. Uh, time just wouldn't uh, enable us to tell all the memories that we have being here and being at Brother Marvin and Sister Faye's house on. Uh, on numerous numerous weekends and and um, it's just just very thankful. I think it was November second, two thousand and two, that me and Brother Ronnie were ordained here together, and um, I was unsure about it then. And uh, twenty two years later, I'm still unsure about it. 
And so I just ask that you continue to pray for me that the Lord would use us in, in a way that would be beneficial to you and be glorifying to God. <clears throat> Brother Ronnie <clears throat> mentioned something there uh, about that about that psalm um, that struck a chord with me and that is talking about uh, fearing uh, the condemnation the first point that he that he brought out and and uh, it caused me to think and I want to I want to take your minds for a little while this morning uh, and you pray for me to the eighth chapter of Romans and the eighth chapter of Romans in the first verse the Apostle Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak in the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of flesh, and, and, and the for what the law could not do, and that it is weak through the flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Uh, it was the Lord that condemned it. Now Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Uh, now you don't start a thought with the word therefore. It, it is a. It is a. It means that there's more that uh, that goes on with it. In order to understand much of of God's word, what we what we need to realize is to put things in its proper context. And by doing that, we can get we can gain a lot more understanding. I believe in what God's word says by putting things in its proper context. And number two, realizing also that the chapters are not the division of thoughts. Uh, just because you start off with a new chapter does not mean you're starting off with a new thought. Uh, that those are there, those chapters and those verses are there uh, so that we can easily obtain them. So we can, we can have a, a, a way to, to, uh, to find the scriptures that we're looking for. Uh, but they're but they're not bringing bringing out new thoughts. So, and that's why the apostle Paul said, "There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the Spirit, or I'm sorry, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit." Now, the there's a standalone thought in this in this first verse. And the standalone thought, I believe, is there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, if the Lord would have seen fit to put a period there, we would still understand what He's saying. That there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That second part of that verse is simply added commentary to what the Apostle Paul has already said. It is not something that we have to do. It's a statement of who we are, those that are in Christ Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Therefore, Paul said in the 5th chapter of 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. All things are done away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, preacher man, how is it that you get in Christ Jesus? Well, you don't get in Christ Jesus of your own, uh, of your own doing, of your own works, of your own merits. And you certainly don't get into Christ Jesus because of your own desires. Because I assure you, before you were in Christ Jesus, you had no desires to be in Christ Jesus. But he says over in the first chapter of, of, uh, of 1 Corinthians, but of Him are ye in Christ Jesus. Of Him? Who's the Him? He's talking about God. But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that it is written, He that glorieth, let him what? Let him glory in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we have nothing to glory in and of ourselves. All of our 
glory goes toward God for what God has done. We are a child of God. We have the hope of of God in our hearts that Brother Ronnie spoke about because of the matchless love and grace of God towards us from before the foundation of the world. There was no chance, dear child of God, that you were ever going to be lost. If God loved you, and He loved you from before the foundation of the world, you've always been His. You have always been His. You've never... uh, and, And we don't have to fear that, Brother Ronnie, as Brother Ronnie mentioned. No, if you fear and feel condemnation upon you, it's a great evidence that you are a child of God. It is a great evidence that that God is is working in your heart. We said it's a description, it's, it's, it's added commentary to say, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You remember in the 25th chapter of Matthew, when, when the Lord comes and, and He separates the sheep from the goats, and He puts the sheep in His right hand and the goats on the left, and He tells the sheep on His right hand, you remember all these things that He says that they did? For I was in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you, and, and you came to me. I was, I was naked and you clothed me. I, I was these things and you were here. To, you see, that's added commentary for the child of God. They said, when did we do these things? Those things are not what makes them a child of God. Those things that they did do not make them a child of God. Those things show forth that they already are a child of God. Because they said, when did we do these things? He said, inasmuch as you've done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You see what I'm saying? Don't don't take that Matthew 25 and say, "Well, I got to I got to I got to get my check off list here <laughs> and make, make sure that I've done everything that I that I need to do so I can be one of His sheep." Let me tell you something about spiritual evolution. It's the same as natural evolution. A, a goat will never evolve into a sheep, and thanks be to God, a sheep will never evolve into a goat. If you've been a sheep, you'll always be a sheep. And thank God for that. That's the gospel that Brother Ronnie's talking about. That that warms my soul. He goes on to say here, uh, that who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, there is a sense in which a child of God that is in Christ Jesus is walking... After the flesh, uh, or is not walking, excuse me, I'll get this right, is not walking after the flesh, but is walking after the Spirit because he has the Spirit of God in his heart. Now, does that mean that we can't walk in the flesh in this life, the child of God? Does, Does that mean... That if we're walking after the flesh and we're in Christ, or we're walking after the Spirit and we are in Christ, does that mean that we can't sin? That we can't go against God? That we can't uh, be uh, rebellious and disobedient to God in this life? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What did he say in the in the fifth chapter of Ephesians? He said, "And you were for you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord? Walk as children of light." He said, "You you've been delivered from the power of darkness, like he said over in the first chapter of in the thirteenth verse of Colossians, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us." into the kingdom of His dear Son, that kingdom of grace that we have been translated by God into. <clears throat> and so, when He says that, that, that we were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light, walk as children. of He's saying, walk as you are. If you're a child of God, this is what He's saying, and you are... He said, you, you ought to walk that in this life. 
So we can walk in a way that is disobedient to God. This is not particularly what this is talking about. What Paul is talking about here is there is a is is the added commentary that there is now no condemnation. You see, one that is walking after the Spirit, or that is walking after the Spirit, can still do wrong. And unfortunately, we do do wrong from time to time. But you can't do wrong about it. You can't do wrong and feel good about it. There's a change. Okay? There's a change in your heart. Yes, you might be able to go to the honky tonk. You might be able to... You, you have the ability or the free will, if you will... To, to go off and live a, a life of sin. But I tell you what, you will make a, a mess of your life and lose out on the joys and blessings of being in fellowship with God in this life. You're already, a, the sonship's already there. The relationship is already there. You ever heard somebody say you, you need to have a relationship with God? I, we had a relationship with God before we were ever born. Our relationship to God is He is my Father and thanks be to God I am His Son. But what I need is I need fellowship with Him in this life. He says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now, the Apostle Paul, we'll have to move along here. Uh, in the seventh, now I said the therefore. What is the therefore, therefore? So let's, let me flip back and let us go to the seventh chapter of Romans. And we'll see Paul's uh, experience. And, and what you have in, in chapter seven is Paul's experience or emotion, okay, of condemnation. His experience and his emotion of condemnation. All right. And so what really what, what he says here in this in this seventh chapter in this seventh chapter, and then what 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 he brings about in starting off in eight one, Romans eight one, is that he confirms no condemnation to those who feel condemnation. That there is no condemnation. You, you feel the condemnation? Well, what he says when he opens up the 8th chapter is, because you feel that condemnation, there is no Amen. condemnation. Right. You see what I'm saying? That's what Paul's saying. That's what Brother Ronnie was saying this morning. Listen to what he says in that 5th verse of that 7th chapter. For when we were in the flesh... The most when we were in the flesh, walking after the flesh. Okay? That's what Paul's talking about. Paul's in the flesh naturally, when right here at this time, isn't he? But he, but he's talking about when 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 he what, before he was born again. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit. Unto what? Death. Brought forth fruit unto death. The only fruit you've been able to produce as a dead alien sinner is one as a fruit unto death. And we can go in different places in the seventh chapter of Mark and over and 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 look at the fruits and the the, the works of the flesh in Galatians and and we can we can see those things there and, and and they just work they work death. And he goes, but now we are delivered. Now Paul brings this but in, and I love these these buts of the Bible. But he says, now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He goes on to say, what shall we say then? Is the law of sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So he's saying, I knew the law, 
heaven and he was brought up at the feet of Gamal. He knew the written law. He knew it was wrong to do something because it was written out there. You see, they were given the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament by God when Moses brought them down. Well, the second time that that he brought the the tables of stone down and, and they could see the law of God there. But you know what? The child of God has already got the law written in their hearts. When they're born again by the Spirit of God. You remember uh, over in, in, in Genesis? Listen, let me show this to you. Let me prove that to you. Uh, over in, in Exodus, uh, when uh, they made a decree that all the, all, the, all the newborn males should be put to death. Right? Because Israel was, was gaining so much in, 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 in their numbers that they were afraid that they might overtake them at some point. So they so the Pharaoh sent out a decree to kill all of the all, now this is way before Moses on Mount Sinai, right? Moses hadn't even what was just a child here and I hadn't even been born at this time. It says and, and when he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see and see them upon the stools, if it be a son that ye shall not kill him, but if it be a daughter if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. What's the next verse say there in that 17th verse? But the midwives feared God. They feared God. This was before the tables of stone that said, Thou shalt not kill. Who gave them the fear in their heart? That they should not kill these children. It was God. God was already in their heart. Amen. That's right. Amen. And until you're born again by the Spirit of God, all you have is the written law. That's right. But when you're born again by the Spirit of God, that law is written in your heart. Amen. You got me? That's right. So it's there inwardly. <clears throat> Why, why do you, why, why can you not get away with the things that you once said? Why do you have a desire from time to time to get down on your knees and pray to God and, and to beg forgiveness? Why do you feel bad sometimes when you say something or think something or do something and you know it's out of the way? You didn't have to go read it in some law book. You know where it's written? Right here. You carry it with you. You can't hide from it. No matter where you're at, that heart, that written law is right there with you. It'll, uh, condemn it, else uh, 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 agreeing with you or condemning you. One of the two. So we see here Paul in this experience or emotion of condemnation, listen to what he says in the 8th verse of that 7th chapter. But sin taking occasion by the commandment, in other words, it means sin took opportunity to attack. It took occasion. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscences as just evil desires, for without the law, sin was dead. Without the law, sin was dead. It doesn't mean there wasn't sin. He just didn't have a, He just didn't have an idea of it. It was dead to him. That's right. Because he, he had he had no uh, because he didn't have the law written in his heart. It goes on to say here, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, what commandment? That commandment that was written in his heart. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now the Apostle Paul says, I was alive once without the law. Now I'm dead with the law in my heart. You know why? Because it has convicted him. It shown sin for what it is. For this is not a, a message 
as I have heard outside in the in this Christian world, this seventh chapter of Romans is not a message of somebody that needs to get saved. Okay? Far from it. This is a message of somebody that is going through the emotions of condemnation in this life because the law is written in their hearts in the new birth and they see that they are now condemned. Or they feel to be condemned. Do you know what that child of God needs right then? The Gospel. That's right. He needs the Gospel. He needs to know that you're not condemned. That's why He would say further on here, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who shall deliver me? A lot of people say, well, the missionary preacher, or, or, the, the, you know, that, or it's going to be Mama's prayers, it's going, to, it's going to be the church, they're the ones that's going to save me. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of, the, of this death? What did Paul say? I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now let me back up here just a little bit. And he he says further, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That is, he saw the condemnation. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. You see the experience he's having here of this condemnation? You know when a child of God is born again by the Spirit of God it's not a great and glorious day. When a child of God is born again by the Spirit of God I've talked with people and they say, they say Hallelujah, I can tell you the very day, the very hour that I received Christ that I became a child of God. And I rejoiced with joy unspeakable. You know, they would say something. And I, and I was thinking, no, that, that wasn't when you were born again by the Spirit of God. That's when you had a, that's when you decided you wanted to follow the Lord. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, that's not when they were born again. I'll tell you, uh, it, it may have been five minutes before. It may have been 30 minutes before. It may have been a day before. It may have been a week before. I don't know how long before. But it wasn't right then at that time. Because when a child of God is first born again by the Spirit of God, he who thought himself to be so good now sees himself to be nothing. You got me? He's no longer Lord of His universe anymore. Now He sees a greater being. And that greater being is Jesus Christ. And it's then that child of God mourns after their sins. It's a day of mourning. But oh, how the Gospel will rejoice. How the Gospel will cause that poor child of God to rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for them on the cross at Calvary. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Deceived me. You know sin deceives us all the time. In the church even. I've known of people that Waited a long time before they ever joined the church because they didn't feel like they were good enough. All they could see was their sins, you see. It didn't feel like sin. Sin had deceived them. They were saying, I I don't feel worthy to be in the Lord's house. I don't feel uh, like I would match up, that that I would add anything to this church. Well, brothers and sisters, I've got something to tell you. If you're not in the church and that's how you feel, you are the right candidate for the church. You're the right candidate for the church. The church is for sinners. You hear me? The church is not for good doers. If you think you coming into the church is going to promote the church, then you maybe ought to rethink your decision. (laughs) I'll just put it to you that nicely. But if you come in more 
Not feeling to be uh, feeling to be less than the least of saints. Not worthy of God's church. Listen, none of us, brothers and sisters, are worthy to be here today. None of us. Me above all. <laughs> to come to God's people to preach the, the marvelous grace of God. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be in the Lord's house. But I tell you what, He's worthy to be praised. And He's the one we ought to be praising each and every time we gather together and we esteem one another greater than ourselves. After going through all that, and I'm going to close here, the Apostle Paul go right back to 8 1, Romans 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. Even though he was riddled with the concept in, uh, of, of, of condemnation in, his, in, in the emotions of condemnation, you realize because of that there is therefore now no condemnation. There is no condemnation. What a glorious gospel is that. That the child of God who feels to be nothing but a wretched sinner can come to the point through the gospel that he sees that he has been justified by the blood of Christ. And that heaven is his home. Now there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And I want to tell you what, brothers and sisters, if you ever get to doubt yourself again, you can open up that Bible. You can go back to Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, tomorrow if you need it. And you know what it will say? It will say the same thing that it says this morning. That's right. It will say the same thing that it says this morning. And if you become, and you get in need, and you need it next week, you know what? Romans 8, 1 will still be there. It will still be there reminding you that there is no condemnation. And He paid the condemnation fully complete on the cross. God bless you. I appreciate the time. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone. Hallelujah, Thy glory. I feel like I could say amen and we could go home. <clears throat> I know Brother Charles knows that I don't stand too long, so it's probably why I got me coming last, but I feel like an hour and a half sermon. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <clears throat> I want to read to you from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah to begin with. The 11th verse, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I wish a lot of preachers would read that and understand yes. it. Amen. 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 That's right. He said, I have declared, and have saved, and have showed when there was no strange God among you. <clears throat> Therefore, you are my. Witness, saith the Lord, that I am God. <clears throat> now the nation of Israel was to be a witness to God. They had experienced and seen the many miracles that he had performed among them. And I believe to some degree you and I 
as God's children today can be a witness. And then he says, <clears throat> Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that delivereth out of my hand, I will work, and who shall let it? God says, I'm going to work, and who's going to hinder it? Yeah, right. <clears throat> and when it came to the salvation of God's children, God took care of it yeah, by His work. Right. We'll turn to the New Testament <clears throat> and we'll read several of those places where God worked. God is such a wonderful worker that He worked through His Son to save all the elect family of God and not one of them will be lost as well Gary has mentioned this morning <clears throat> in the second chapter of the book of Romans my wife tells me I need my glasses sometimes so I, I'll put them on <clears throat> the apostle says that salvation is by the grace of God. And you know what grace is? It's something you don't work for. <clears throat> Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Though it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to you first and also to the Greek. For therein is the power in the gospel of the Son of God there's power that feeds God's children while we live here in this world. Right. Yes, yes sir. Absolutely. That's what the gospel is for. The gospel is food to the trembling child of God. Amen. Right. And it's food that you can't get nowhere else. Amen. Right. That's true. It's only in the gospel the child of God can feel his sins and know that his sins have been paid for. Amen. Right. Yes. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed, brother, of the gospel. Mm. Because it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. <clears throat> if you don't have faith this morning in your heart... Right. from being born to the Spirit of God because faith is a fruit of the Spirit. And if you don't have faith, you don't get the gospel. Mm, that's right. <laughs> but if you have faith in your heart, and I've got faith, then you can be fed. Uh. For therein is the righteousness of God Reveal from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith I'm glad this morning that over 52 years ago God opened my eyes to the truth I had three brothers that were preaching before I started. Somebody asked me, said one day, said, when are you going to start? I said, when I get ready. <laughs> I'd have never got ready. I'd still be sitting on the bench if God hadn't worked something in me. I used to be one of the worst sinners ever, be, ever, ever lived on this earth. I'm telling you now. You may not think so, Brother Ronnie, but I'm pretty tough. I won't make me a 
I doubt there's a sailor anywhere in the world that could outpuss me. And I remember the first time that I tried to curse and couldn't. I've always wanted to be on time everywhere I went. Especially at church. There was a brother who to pick me up that morning and take me to work. And he was running late. And I wanted to tell him about it, but I couldn't. And I thank God that he worked something in my heart to take away that desire to curse. God works in us. He works in no hindrance. Aren't you glad of that this morning? God is a God of love and mercy. In the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is of it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You didn't work for your salvation, but God did. Right. That's right. When He sent His Son, His only Son, into this world, it was for the purpose of saving sinners. Right. Amen. The angel of God declared to Joseph, as Joseph was contemplating how he could put his wife away privately, right. yes. not make a display out of it. The angel said, Fear not, Joseph, to take unto thee thy wife, for that which is conceived in her of her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Brother Charles, that's what he did. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And the angel said, You're going to call him Jesus. And the reason you're going to call him Jesus is because he's a Savior. He's going to save his people from their sins. He worked and none hindered. In the first verse of this chapter, Paul says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's the condition that you all all of us were in, except we were born of the Spirit like John the Baptist was before he was ever born of the flesh. We were all dead in trespass and sins and could not deliver ourselves from the condition that we were in. And we walked just as those who are in the flesh at that time. But God who is rich in mercy. I love the I love the entire Bible, but eight chapter of Romans and the first chapter of Ephesians, first two books of Ephesians are just glorious, aren't they? For for what we believe. Let's turn over to Timothy. No, I don't know. I, I go to Hebrews, I turn to it anyhow. I only go to the 10th chapter, the 14th verse. Paul says, For by one of them right. he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Right. Isn't that something? For by one offering he hath what? Perfected forever them that are sanctified. How in the world can a man stand before God's children and tell them that if you don't do something you're going to go to hell? When this verse says that they are made perfect by one offering. Right. Who's going to condemn them? Right. Who do you think is going to condemn them? It's not God that's going to condemn them because He justified them. He justified them through the shed blood of His Son on Calvary's cross. For by one of them, I want you to get this verse. If you don't get nothing else, I say, just He made just one offering, and through that one offering, He perfected forever 
them that are sanctified. That just simply means everyone that was sanctified will be in heaven with God after this life is over. I used to wake up at night. I guess I was dreaming I was in hell. Be scared to death. I don't know whether you all have done that or not. But that tormented me for a while. But you know what? For the last 53 years, I've never had a fear of dying and going to hell. That's wonderful, isn't it, brother? Amen. Yeah, yeah. That's right, brother. Because I believe with all my heart that blood was shed Amen. to take away my sin. Amen. And I stand before God today, as Brother Kerry said, without any condemnation. Mm. That's a positional text, Brother Kerry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It shows us the position that we're in before our great God. I've heard somebody try to preach that one time and try to make that walking after the flesh. That just didn't do do nothing for me. There's a couple more places and then I'm going to sit down. I just killed him about an hour and a half. I'm hungry too. <laughs> In the third chapter of Titus, Paul says, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. I think that word you knew it just means indwelling. I think all of us have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us when we are born of the Spirit of God, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's go back and read that again. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Your works didn't have a thing in the world would you been saved from hell to heaven. Not by our works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I've got something in me this morning that's not a wish. I've got something in me that's both sure and steadfast. I've got a hope of one day living with my Savior in heaven. And that hope is an anchor to my soul, both sure and steadfast, which is entered into the veil where the forerunner has already entered with body. Yeah. Once in a while, I feel like I can feed him tugging. <laughs> <clears throat> I may be the oldest one here this morning. I don't know. But you get old, you kind of wear out. But when something does work, man, it's good, isn't it? One more place and I'll...
sit down. Second Timothy. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. There are some afflictions in the gospel. Yes. <clears throat> Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before the world began. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. I told a story. I want y'all to forgive me. I'm going to go one more place. I'm going to go to the book of Revelations. To the first chapter. The fifth verse. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto him, unto God and his Father, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. It's Jesus Christ that washed us from our sins in his own blood and he's made us kings and priests unto God. You say, I'm not a king. Well, you are, whether you know it or not. And you are a priest, whether you know it or not. You're a king because you've been made a king. And you have the authority as king over your body Amen. That's right, to prove, mortify the deeds That's of right. the flesh. That's right. And as a priest, you have the golden opportunity to present your body as a living sacrifice to God. Mm. Ooh, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, amen. God has made us kings and priests unto Him. He has washed us in His own blood. So this morning, if you didn't know you were a king, you got the authority to mortify the deeds of the flesh, right. crucify, mm -hmm. and live a life of worship by presenting your body as a living sacrifice. That's right. I think God said when He said that, He said, I've had enough dead sacrifices, boys. <laughs> Yeah. I've had enough dead sacrifices presented to me. I want now a living sacrifice. That's right, Brother Dan. May God help you. And may God bless us all. That while we live here in this world, we can give him the glory that's due his wonderful and glorious name. When you pray, remember me in your prayer. Amen. Brother Dan said something about being hungry. Well, I know there's good food back there, but I'll tell you what, I think we've heard some pretty good food already. Not food for this natural body, but food for our souls. Amen. I told Brother Dan we was talking before they brought and I've enjoyed these brethren this morning. You know, sometimes a child of God gets down. Right. There was an old reformer many years ago. He wasn't. He was a reformer, but he said these words: "Feelings come and feelings go, and feelings are deceiving. My word is the word of God, and all else is worth believing." What we've heard this morning is God's word. And I know that you've enjoyed it. Brother, I've enjoyed all of them. Me and Brother Dan was talking before, preaching on before the service started this morning. I might be different than a lot of people. But I ain't no different than you, Brother Dan, because I noticed you wanted to holler. 
<laughs> and they sometimes that I want to. Yeah. That's something I That's right, amen. I'm bowed and full of sin in this body. But I'm glad there is that for now no condemnation. Amen. My sins were washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, my Savior. How wonderful is that? Amen. And you know, we love the brethren. You know what happens when God mourns His people again? We love the brethren, don't we? Yeah. That that we want saved, we love. Mm -hmm. But we love Him because He first loved us. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a dear brother not long ago, a dear friend. And we was talking about the fact that we're sinners. And sometimes the devil throws doubts at you, don't he? But he said to me, I know that I love Him. Do you know you love Him this morning? I know that I love Him because He first loved me. Mm -hmm. Let's say, I want these brothers to stand with me. We're going to sing hymn number 284. I want you to come around and shake hands with them and with one another. And just stand the same. Come on, Brother Terry, Brother Lonnie, Brother Dan. Come stand with us. Oh, how happy are they who their Savior will lay and who saves their Father. Thank <laughs> you. 
Somebody say this, and I'm going to shut up. You sat here this morning as monuments of grace. Do you believe that? Mm. Therefore, it is of grace that it might be my faith. And he says this. Therefore, it is of work. Therefore, it is of grace. And if not by grace, therefore, it is of grace. And if it's of grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more of grace. And if it be of works, then it's no more of grace. Otherwise, works is no more of works. 
if it was 9,999% grace and just one little bit of percent of works, then it's no more grace. And if it's so, what you've got to do in order to be saved, I can't do it. And you couldn't either. But I know in my heart because of what the Bible says it's a grace. If I had justice today, you know where I'd be? Mm. I'd be in hell. If you had justice today, you'd be in hell. But because of God's loving grace, we are here. I want us to sing the first verse of What a Friend. What a Friend. A friend liveth at all times. And there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Let's sing the first verse of What a Friend we have in Jesus. And I'm going to ask a dear friend of mine, just like a friend of yours, when we close this, the first verse of this, I'm going to ask him if he would dismiss the sin of prayer. Then we'll go back to the fellowship hall. Don't be in no hurry. But I'm going to ask him after this first verse if he would dismiss the sin prior. And also ask for blessing on the table back here. What a
Lord, we love you for all things. Forgive us where we play the Lord, I pray for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, brother. Well, you know, back more than you do.